Today, I'm speaking with Mr. David Sollers, who is a diplomat of the American Institute of Stress. Mr. Sollers also serves on the AIS Daily Life Stress Board and is a frequent contributor to Contentment Magazine. Uh, Mr. Sollers has worked as a healthcare solutions entrepreneur for more than 28 years. He is a integrative medicine practitioner, author, medical educator, a leadership development keynote speaker, a trainer, and a coach. Uh, Mr. Sollers served as the legislative chair for the uh, Massachusetts State Acupuncture Organization that negotiated uh, licensure for acupuncturists in the 1980s. Mr. Sollers is the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Acupressure and Acupuncture and also the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Homeopathy. Uh, Mr. Sollers also serves as a senior editor for Natural Standard and is part of a writing collaborative that has published several books and has published many articles in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, let's get Mr. Sollers on the phone and find out more about him. Welcome, Mr. Sollers, how are you today? Fine, Kelly, thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm so happy to get to talk with you a little bit more in depth on some of these things. Uh, we talk often and you have a lot to say, so I'm excited to, to get to know you a little bit better. Now, I've got to start by asking, um, I know you live and work very near Boston. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the mood in the city today? Have you seen any sort of therapeutic responses being enacted? Well, thank you for asking. Of course, we had the uh, terrible bombings around the marathon, which is a beautiful time here, a celebrated time here in Boston. And we had the tragedy of the bombings for the runners and some of the people that were standing around with their family. So what's happened, I think, is what we see happen uh, over our country with these acts of terrorism. Uh, we have an initial trauma, and we hype up the media, we talk about it. There's a lot of worry. I was in a conference. I was in a four-day conference when that happened, and it was a surreal event. I think it marred the beginning. We had to do check-ins with people constantly because some areas of the city were being shut down. Right. What's happened since is, uh, I think, very encouraging because you see post-traumatic stress that comes from, from an event like that where it really does cause uh, damage. There's been a huge therapeutic response in the medical community and the therapy community to help those uh, victims and their families. But now what we're also seeing is another study that shows uh, post-traumatic growth. And in post-traumatic growth, people start to learn how to be better than they were before. So a traumatic situation elevates their abilities, points out a, a situation that was so difficult and displaced them in such a strong way that they actually grew in their abilities. And that's right. where people come together, okay. communities come together, and they find strength that they hadn't celebrated before. And of course, last night was the Boston Strong Conference uh, con uh, you know, concert. Yeah, so there were yeah. a lot of people that came together from all over the country to celebrate the strength that people gain when they come together uh, after some sort of a trauma. So I think we're, we're experiencing the post-traumatic growth of a community, and then we also realize that the people who are directly involved need to have our continued support as they heal. Of course. Well, you know, there's certainly no shortage of people who will need help now and in the future they're in Boston, but all across the U.S. You know, I'm sitting here in Texas and our neighbors to the north um, and more Oklahoma just experienced, you know, the tragedy of that massive tornado. So, right. you know, there's lots of people that are coming together and and really, it's a good measure of resilience. So it's interesting to see, um, right. you know, just the depth that people really have um, when they're tested and traumatic events such as this. So absolutely, yes. Now, Mr. Sollers, you're a, a pioneer, 
um, in the integrative medicine <laughs> movement. And you actually wrote the books on it, um, which I think is really neat. Um, you know, you wrote the Idiot's Guide to Acupressure and Acupuncture, and right. then the Complete Idiot's Guide to Homeopathy. Right. Uh, that's amazing. Tell me, you know, from an integrative perspective, um, what's a good treatment plan for people dealing with stress in particular? Well, how do you integrate acupressure, acupuncture uh, with more traditional Western medicine? Well, that's a great question. Uh, we started some integrative uh, clinics, which were not called that. You got to remember that integrative as a word really was coined by Andrew Weil, who's the physician in Arizona, who started talking about techniques and therapies that are not taught in a traditional medical school environment. So that's what defines that entire area. Well, that's becoming a larger and larger emerging area of medicine. And as we know from the financial world, many of the rich rewards lie in emerging markets. Well, many of the rich rewards for patients lie in these emerging integrative therapies as well. Right. And so I, I sort of got into it when uh, back in the early 80s when I can remember my parents looking at this and saying, we're very worried about you. <laughs> I, I saw this as something that really uh, attracted me because it, it, people who were falling through the cracks could get some help. People who didn't fall into a traditional category were able to get some help. Right. So as soon as I could, my very first clinic had uh, an integrative model without even being called that because it just made sense to me that we would collaborate. So when you talked about integrative medicine, I brought in, uh, our, our clinic had three or four physicians, psychopharmacology, LSWs, we had PTs, OTs, registered dietitians, and then on another side of the ball, we had our acupuncturists and our chiropractors and our herbalists and our massage therapists and people that were doing uh, other kinds of meditation. Uh, and what we would do is get together and say, what's the without saying patient-centered care, which is another word that didn't exist, but we would say, without any boundaries, without any turf warfare, what would you do to help this patient? How do you see this situation and what would you do? Then we'd have case conferences on difficult patients and we'd find innovative treatment plans to help people break through the barrier that was keeping them from their full potential. I learned a lot during those nine years and I've right. had seven clinics and we run that model in the past. Uh, up until today, I'm probably one of the most ravenous referrers for conventional medicine. I refer people to, to physicians, to psychologists, to the help that they need. And I, th I think it's so important for you to understand what you do well, what's your slice of the pie, right. you very well, and that you'll understand what's your core competencies, and then what else needs to be done. And I approach it sort of from a coaching mentality where I ask the patient, many of the curious questions to find out where the gaps in care are. And then I have enough of a network now with being in practice almost 30 years to be able to fill in those gaps with qualified people and really put the team together with the patient at the center so that they can get well on whatever level that they're looking for. Right, right. Well, you know, at AIS, we're completely in support of an integrated uh, health and wellness plan um, approach to complete whole body wellness. You know, our fellows and diplomates such as yourself have been at it um, over 35 years uh, researching approaches such as um, CES, which is the electromagnetic uh, cranial stimulation. Um, mm. Yes, you know, our president, uh, Dr. Kirsch, actually invented the Alpha Stem device that uses this electromagnetic therapy, these tiny uh, microcurrents of electricity um, to treat things like anxiety, depression, pain, insomnia, you know, but I don't know if you know this, but before he invented that device, he started out as an acupuncturist. And many of the ways that he uses this device is those acupressure and acupuncture points. Um, and yep. so he's, you know, been at this 30 years, just like yourself. and. I've heard a lot of the stories of how this field emerged and kind of the early resistance and how the tides are changing and things are starting to shift. Uh, what, you know, what sorts of 
uh, resistance have you seen in the past? How have things changed from when you first started out? Well, I, I think things have changed considerably, and then in one area, not so much. And I'll tell you what those are. So I've had some great conversations with Dr. Kirsch about his early years doing acupuncture and acupuncture research, and he and I met on that place of those early years, you know, certainly back in the 80s where new studies were coming out and innovation was coming out. I think acupuncture has not changed in the fact that it's been a safe and reliable solution. So it's always been that way. You got to remember that we're inheriting information that's over 3,500 years old. So we are not the first to do this. We are not the first society to do it. We're not the first group of people to implement it into their care. We're actually custodians of a large body of knowledge currently where we're integrating new cultures, a diversity of experiences, and new innovative ways to use this knowledge to help a wide range of ailments that really our society suffers from. A large society, which is a global society, will suffer. What I've seen is the resistance is that we no longer can afford to have ideas that are based on turf warfare. We can no longer have, afford to have ideas that are based on control of people, of money, and of population. We just you can't just said it. that the key word there is money. I, I think you hit on it. Yeah, we can't afford mm -hmm. to keep things from people that work. And so now you're starting to see many of these uh, plans offer it because it works. And I, I think also one of the keys to my early work is creating collaborative teams. And what I found out, and certainly what we do now in, in some of the leadership work that I do, because I've seen this now, is you put in these groups of people together. Collaboration is based on shared knowledge of somebody's expertise. Also, trust comes from understanding what they do, that they're quite good at it, and that you've had an actual personal experience where that person or that process has been a benefit to you personally. Now you build trust and there's a willingness to collaborate. So you come out of your silo, so we break down these silo systems because people have had these experiences with each other and then right. they're allowed to start to collaborate. So I think the collaborative model is the model of business now and it's the model that medicine needs to have as well. Yes, you know, I, I definitely agree with those statements. I, I wonder, was this sort of, um, beginning of, of bringing people together, uh, you wrote the books, you know, you wrote the, the Complete Idiot's Guide. Was that an effort to bring this knowledge maybe more mainstream? What, what was behind writing these fantastic books? Well, thank you for the word fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, they're still in print and, and yeah. they're, they're on Kindle and you can buy them in a variety of places here. You know, we need to get them in the marketplace, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so the idea is that uh, I wanted to have something to educate patients at a, at, a, at a beginning level. You know, we needed a primer. And the Idiot's Guide series is great for that. Whenever you see something that's really emerging into the world, you, you start to see Idiot's Guides and Dummies books come out because they want to educate a large population of people on something that works, a trend that seems to be working. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is now out in, it's 14 years this book has been out. So 14 years. Typically, idiot guides are out two to three years. And then you find them in some A dusty other place. corner of the library. Right. But this continues to be an emerging story. So even though Dr. Kirsch and I have been doing this work for over 30 years, the American public and, and the global public is sort of waking up to the possibilities right. of what can I do myself? How can I put together a team of people What's my part in this? Now, you got to remember that one of the things that drew me into integrative medicine in the beginning is that it was one of the early bastions of self-improvement, of personal development, of early organizational development. What can a person do in their own team? So that was very attractive to me. The whole right. self-improvement business, the personal development, developing the self, helping organizations develop. Uh, integrative medicine was really one of the petri dishes of this early movement and supported it because we wanted patient interaction, patient help, patient engagement and involvement. And, and, and sort of this is really why 
I wanted these books to be written and why I and there's several other books that I've written and they're all on the same area of letting people know what they can do, how they can better use self empowerment. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you see as the next step or the next phase um, as far as this integrative medicine movement? Where do you see it going in the next 10, 20 years? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, wh what I see is, uh, well, let's talk about the medicine, then we'll also talk about a person's role. So the medicine, I see it being integrated more and more. You start to have large studies that are done in Britain where they show that low back pain and migraine sufferers who used to be out of work can have can be in work more often by using acupuncture. So that got their attention. They put it into their national insurance plan. You're seeing this all wow. over the world now because people are able to stay healthy. And when you're healthy, you can interact with your family, you can work, you can do the health. It's society can stay healthy. Right. So I see this being integrated more, covered by insurance plans, being available for a larger group of people in hospitals, medical offices, large medical practices. I see the ability to access this kind of medicine happening quickly. I think, I think it's going to happen soon. So then what's a patient's role? And this is really what gets interesting for me because as an intervention, we could change this to a transactional. Come in, put the needles in, the magic happens, leave. Now that's not what integrative medicine is about. Integrative medicine is a conversation. Integrative medicine, remember, is what can a person do to help their world. So what are you doing with your stress? How are you working with the leadership in your life? How are you doing at work? What are the relationships that you have? What functionally do you need to do at work to make that better? How about your diet, exercise? It's personal leadership that then leads to you taking a leadership position in your life, your business, and your relationships. And that becomes a patient's primary goal. So I think if we don't want to lose that piece because that's what sustains the growth. Otherwise, we just have one more intervention that right. people come in through like a drive through Right. And I, and I don't believe that that's been the success of Oriental Medicine or, or any of the integrated medicine. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable, exactly. A patient's involvement, understanding what they're doing, and taking a role in their health, that's sustainable. Well, this kind of leads me to my next question. You know, you've got all this uh, background clinically. Um, dealing with acupressure and acupuncture and their, your integrative medicine clinics. But the other arm of your body of work, you know, yeah. you're, you're wildly successful as a, you know, keynote speaker in leadership development and executive coaching. How, you know, how did you make that transition? What, what brought that on to taking it out of the clinic and into the workplace? Ooh, I like the way you said that. <laughs> uh, there's a book right there. Yeah. So um, what happened was really these things, uh, really all the areas of study or improvement that I've done have been based organically in what patients told me they needed. So anything that I tried to study that I didn't know was to try to fill a gap that I thought, you know, patients needed, wanted, and I would see whether that's for me or not for me, and I could just know somebody who did but of course, I'm ravenously curious about so many things, so I want to learn it, whether I do it or not. But the area of uh, leadership became a fascination for me because more and more of my patients had enormous stress in their business. They had enormous stress in their relationships. They, their stress was coming from an unworkable solution where they were being asked to have skills that they didn't have and operated a higher level of performance in a workplace. That became an area of enormous stress. So I thought, well, maybe I should learn about this area. So I started taking leadership development. I had already done personal development for, for years. That was really my number one thing. But leadership development, studying how corporate workplace works, what's a person's role in their own personal and organizational leadership. Now, that was new for me. So I started studying those things uh, probably about 10 or, 10 or 12 years ago and started then networking and, and dialoguing with patients about what they need. So then, of course, I'm a creative person, so I started designing programs and running them and 
bringing in other people to help me run some of these programs or working for other people to learn how they did organizational development, executive coaching, understanding that drawing information out of a client or, or was really the best way to get this done and to find engagement with the client in the activity so they make it theirs. Same as medicine. I really see after all these years the same impetus that I had towards patient engagement and making them a part of the process was the same thing that we initialized in designing all the leadership programs, the, the presence, executive presence, and also the, the, the work that we needed to do organizationally. Just right. finding out systemically what was going on with the organization and how you could choose high leverage places, just like an acupuncturist, that would create <laughs> rapid change throughout the organization that would be beneficial to all. Right. Hit right on the right on the spot. Get the exactly. best result. What's the one spot that could create the most dynamic <laughs> change in an organization? It's kind of fascinating. Yeah, right? it really is. It's an interesting way to to approach it. It's very unique, um, it's and it's working. A non-linear background. Yeah, <laughs> but it works. It works so well. Um, no. a, another thing. Now, I'm switching gears with you a little bit, but I, I've heard uh, little rumbles of some new studies. Um, that you're involved with, with this Ironstone Farm and this recent PTSD study using equine therapy. Now, uh, you've got to tell me a little bit more about this and, and what's your involvement there with Ironstone Farm. I can't imagine what, how many hours in the day you've got left over after everything else you've done, but <laughs> somehow um, you're making it happen. So I want to hear about that. Well. Thank you. It's a great team. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk about something that I love and cherish. So Ironstone Farm is here in Andover, Massachusetts, and they were founded 25 years ago as a, as a equine therapy center. So what they do is they use horses to help heal uh, children and adults with different kinds of ailments. So currently, uh, my wife and I have been involved in the organization for about uh, 12, 14 years. I've been chairman of the board for the past 10 years, oh. and it's, it's a labor of love. It's a volunteer position for me, but it's something that I get a tremendous amount of heart. They say, you know, open a heart before you open a hand, and Einstein Farm has opened my heart to see what are possible. Now, of course, I'm open to integrative therapy, something new, something innovative. Right. Uh, obviously, my background, I'm open to that. I see the possibilities. So what we've been able to do with that organization, I think probably one of my tenets has always been collaboration. I'm a big collaborator and I believe in collaborating. So we've reached out to corporations, to hospital groups, to different areas of need where again, people in need are falling through the crack. And this is really what I try to find. And this organization is top drawer at this. So now we see over 500 children a week with oh. disabilities. Wow. A week. Wow. We have about 250 volunteers a week who come and open their heart and then work through their hands to help those that are less fortunate than they are. We have programs that we use equine therapy, which is a burgeoning therapy in, globally. And we start working with people that have uh, dementia. We have a program for dementia. We work with area hospitals, including Dana-Farber, for the work that we do with cancer patients and their families. We also do corporate uh, clients. We work with some of the large corporations that are around the Andover area for team building and team discovery. But probably one of our most recent uh, studies that have been done with the University of New Hampshire and the Bedford Veterans Administration yes. was, yeah, we had 15 uh, veterans that were diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and they came from the Vietnam era all the way up to Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And they had two days work there, one week apart, and I was privileged enough to be in on some of the last uh, check-ins that they did and film some of the video testimonials that they did, and they were phenomenal in the ways that they had changed, the things that they had said, that how they felt when they allowed to lay back on a horse, and for once in the past five, six years, they allowed the horse to carry their worries and anxiety. One man said it was the first time he felt relaxed, despite all the pills, despite
despite all the classes, despite all the right. this work that he's done, this was the way that he was able to finally relax. It was a very moving experience. So as you know, when you do studies, the first one is experiential. Right. We called out information at the first of studies, but we'll be doing two more this summer. And I think it's a burgeoning area for the Veterans Administration, which again, need help in dealing with these men and women. Absolutely. Who are struggling. Yes. With Talk about populations falling through the cracks. I mean, we can't exactly. do enough. So. so this was a phenomenal experience with just outstanding uh, results and outcomes described by the participants. So the next level, we'll start to do more as we do uh, with all the work that we do at Ironstone Farm. I hope that, I believe you have some videos, uh, video footage of some of those experiences and some of the wounded veterans talking about that. Um, and I hope that you'll share that with us and we can post it um, on the website as well. I'm happy to. It's, uh, it's, it's moving. It's yes, moving. okay. It's very yeah. interesting and, and certainly a topic that we should probably touch on as we go forward with our contentment magazine and certainly our combat stress magazine as well. So um, yeah. this is, yeah, it's definitely something interesting that we need to, to follow um, and yeah, shed thanks. light on. These are amazing men and women who work at Ironstone Farm. Uh, you know, I, I just can't say enough about the dedication that they have to the work that they do, but the heart that they bring to their work. I'm, I'm honored to be part of the organization. That's amazing. You know, you, just in this brief conversation that we've had, we, you know, you've got your very busy clinical practice. You've got your very busy coaching and keynote speaking schedule. You're volunteering your time and energy and passions um, to the Ironstone Farm. You're juggling a lot, you know. Uh, does this stress you out? What, what stresses you out? You've got all these balls in the air. I can't imagine it's easy. Well, I have to say that I have a, a, an amazing wife, a partner in life, who has embraced life with sort of the passion and velocity that I do. Um, I think the, the things that really upset me is when uh, people do fall through the cracks. I saw it a lot in my life growing up, and I certainly had a tremendous impact from the people in my life, the death of my own father. Uh, from heart attack, heart disease, uh, and watching him suffer from rheumatoid arthritis for many, many years prior to that had a tremendous effect on me when, when people could not do their best. They were not able to rise to their potential. No one was there for them. And I felt like I was really blessed with having ability and potential and I could rally and, and, and I felt like if I could speak, I could speak for others that couldn't speak. If I could act possibly, I could act for those that could not act. And, and I felt like it was my responsibility to do that and to put those teams together of people who really felt a sense of responsibility. So I, when I'm not able to move and act, that's just what stresses me out. When I see something that I'm not able to do, this is where I feel pent up and, and, right. and I get quite a bit of distress from that. Right. Well, do you have, other than just jumping into the world and taking action, you know, do you have a personal system, um, a set of techniques that are your favorite? Um, I know that you are a practicer of and teacher of Tai Chi and Qi Gong. Um, I might have said that incorrectly, Qi Gong. Yeah, perfect. Oh, okay, good, good. So, you know, what, what do you personally do in your day-to-day -day life? to kind of help you manage this tension and this kind of pull back and forth between doing good and wearing out? Well, thank you for asking. There's two things that I do. Uh, one I've been doing for many, many years, and that's, as you mentioned, uh, part of my discipline is the background in uh, martial arts. So the softer side of that is the Tai Chi and Qigong, many different ways of doing that. Those things are moving meditation, or silent meditations or still meditations. It's a way that I've learned over the years to quiet and center my soul, be able to listen to that inner voice so that I can really hear and understand my instincts. And that helps me from, from the frenetic pace that life can give us. Right. Or some of the uh, sort of vulnerable times that we find ourselves in. We can't stop it. We just have to learn how to surf it. 
Right. So those two I like taxes that. have <laughs> that's another book too. So <laughs> have have been able to really help me. I, a recent uh, place that I go to for comfort and joy is my uh, grandchildren. So we have four grandchildren. Ah. And when they come up and say, Papa, read me a story, my entire stress disappears. And the only thing I focus on is this beautiful child and the story that we're sharing together. And that is a sense of great peace for me with each four of them. And they're all four different. Right. And they all four do this in different ways. Right. But I love all four of them. And they, and they give me more, I swear, than, than I can even imagine giving them. Good. Lots of family support, it sounds like. Yes. We're blessed. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Well, you know, you are a frequent contributor to our Contentment Magazine. And we're so grateful for all of those um, articles and techniques that you share with us. What um, What is your idea of contentment? You spoke about spending time with your grandchildren, so I'm sure that part of the definition is in there. Have you ever found this, this idyllic sense of contentment? Well, I've experienced contentment. Um, I, I mean, one of the blessings and a curse, right, is that I'm always looking for the next challenge. I'm always wondering where I can engage. I'm always trying to find out where I can help, where I can be effective. So you have to be also comfortable with being and be comfortable with understanding what you're doing currently and be okay with that. So that's where I struggle because I'm a doer. I'm interested in doing, and but I'm trained in being. So this is the paradox that is my life. <laughs> I yeah. love being, but I also enjoy doing. That forward so momentum. What I do is I pick metaphors. You know, I have a great partner, Rob Salafia, and we are story archaeologists. And we go into companies and we find the hidden stories that are within their company experience and their brand, and then we help them dust them off and display their brilliance to the world. So one of the great things about these stories is that we're able to use metaphor a lot of times in our work. So, of course, you know from helping others, you help yourself. Exactly. So I found that different metaphors or images or visions are kind of a touchstone that I can have for my contentment, my peace. So I have several places that I've been in the world that I remember. And my brain instantly goes into that wonderful chemical spin where I produce those beautiful contented chemicals of that space, the tinkling of a waterfall, yes. the gentle sun on my, on my body as I sit on the cool uh, blades of the grass, as I hear the river silently go by, and just the tinkle of the rocks in the stream, the glistening of the sun on the waterfall as it splashes over the hill. These are places that I go and I've learned to use, and that they can give me some profound relief, uh, relief whether I'm uh, on a street corner in New York City, right. or whether I'm sitting here in the office in between patients, uh, trying to pull it together after I've heard <laughs> something, you know, either joyous so or pleasant. something incredibly sad. Right. You have to go into the, you have to open the door and be present for the next person. Is this where you draw your inspiration? You mentioned, I love this term, this story archaeologist. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting and it. It tells a lot, you know. You really dig into people's lives and the root causes of why they do what they do and why they are the way they are. Is that where you draw your inspiration? Is from these countless people that you're trying to help? It's absolutely true. Um, I can tell you that we have uh, groups of patients and people, both in uh, in patient care and also leadership development that have gone on to do some astounding things and we have been the catalyst, sort of the little catalytic spark that ignites their fire of freedom. And that, being that catalyst, I get the biggest kick out of hearing from them and watching what they do in the world and this enormous potential that's, that's bound up in people. And if you can find a way to be that spark, then what they do and the stories they tell and the places they go and the lives that they touch, it makes it all worth it. 
the stories are amazing. Yeah, yes, it, it seems like it. And, you know, your story is amazing. And that's, that's part of the reason that we're doing this series of interviews, getting to know our fellows and our diplomates and our members and really looking beyond all your credentials and the books on your wall, but who yeah. you are and, and what led you to this place. You know, um, as a diplomate, you have jumped in at AIS and completely thrown your energy behind our mission, which is to take all this high level, intricate scientific data and translate it and share it with people in such a way that they can relate to it and it will resonate with them and cause this spark, as you mentioned, of change so that they can live a better life, you know? So you've really just taken our mission and just really helping us to further that. What is your personal mission? Do you have a personal sort of mission statement? Well, I, I, I sort of uh, told you in that, yeah. in that piece. I mean, I've always been about stories. That's been my whole life. So whatever way you find me or meet me, we're probably talking in terms of stories. You know, we as a, as a human race, are our neuroscience is wired for stories. We remember them. We react to them. We can hear complicated information in a story. We can relate to pictures and metaphors and understanding the emotions of a person through a story. So I've always been a storyteller, whether it began listening to my Uncle Don in the town barber shop when I was just a kid at the mug and brush, <laughs> to just, it's true, to... Just today, sitting and talking to patients and, and them understanding what we're doing through story. So for me, I've always been a story archaeologist. And my purpose is really to be that kind of defiant, never-go-away spark that ignites their fire of freedom. And that's really what I do. I just, I won't stop, I won't quit, and I believe in their potential. Even at the time, they may not. Right. Whether it's people, companies, organizations, or powerful leaders, I believe in their spark of creativity and possibility. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sollers, for taking time out of your day. I know you're in between seeing patients, and I appreciate um, your time. I do have one final question, and it's a doozy. Uh, okay. <laughs> you can please try to answer it with one sentence, okay? Who are you? I'm a storyteller who helps you find and display your brilliance through story. Thank you so much. That's amazing. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you to the AIS for all that you do. It's a wonderful mission, and I'm so happy to get behind it in anything that I can do. Oh, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.